I might set that up for you. Um, everybody, if you guys know the rules, we've all got about five minutes. You are so lucky today because we have no set theme. Um, that means that if anyone is in the audience and you feel so inspired to speak suddenly uh, and you did not put your name in the hat, you don't have a theme to make up that your story or poem uh, has to do with. You can just come up here and just start talking. So if you are so inspired to do so, you may at any moment say, I would also like to join this group of people and share something that I have to say as we have no theme. Um, please get very excited and keep your thinking caps on the entire time as I would love for us to pick a theme as a group that happened to naturally arise from people sharing uh, at the end of our event. So we've got, everybody's got about five minutes. Looks like we are all adults here, um, so our language can be expressive if you've written something that has expressive language in it. As always, we prefer and we expect uh, no hate, hate speech, graphic violence, any of that kind of stuff we're in Princeton. You guys all know what we're doing here. Um, I want to give a very big thank you to Mr. Mark on campus. Um, as you guys know, and I hope, love as much as I do, Mark will be playing in between our performers um, to give us a bit of a palate cleanser. I also will be reading more micro stories, which are completely anonymous. Um, in between performers for as long as they last, you may also get up and add a micro story to the pile if you so feel um, proven or, or called to. Um, just run it up here and hand it to me very quietly. I will take that. So to review, we've got five minutes for everybody. No hate speech, but you can curse if you really need to. Um, we have no theme, so we are really flying by the seat of our pants here. And keep your thinking caps on as we will all select our theme together as a group. I want to give a very big thank you to the Arts Council of Princeton in this beautiful building we're in. And I have some exciting, possible lost and found objects that I'll be either raffling off or hopefully trying to find the owner of throughout the evening. Um, so please get excited for that. Prior to that, though, we have our first performer coming up to the mic. Please put your hands together for a poem from Andrew. Andrew, come on up. Taking the train on Halloween. They reached the surface, but she found another surface under their surface. The corners folded over her, his brilliant imagination erased. Everyone she loved, he hunted her in her bones and said he dreamt her dreams for her. When her nerves became a kaleidoscope, she turned him into a cockroach while he slept. But when he awoke, nothing changed. His evil could be heard in the chewing of cereal, the fuzzy legs tapping on the coffee mug. Then a few days later, he stopped her on the porch before she went to work. He was smoking a cigarette, looking her over like a game show host picking a new assistant. You going out looking like that? He asked. She saw his antenna rising to reach her. That did it. She cut off all her hair and sold all the rings he'd given her. On the train, her green eyes flashed through her werewolf mask. She gazed at the river slinking by, wondering, is this the time to make a wish? Okay. <laughs> um, the 
second one is called The Sea, <clears throat> and um, I had Peter Gabriel like singing in my head for like weeks, and I couldn't get it out. And it wasn't any particular song, it was starting to like all meld into one song. So I figured, okay, fine, I'll write Peter Gabriel lyrics. Uh, so this is called The Sea. <clears throat> I was caught in the rain today, caught in a reflection I could not see. And a cold wave ran across my chest as I remembered leaving you. I didn't know my roving heart could fit so neatly in a suitcase. I didn't know I could disappear over your horizon. So I wandered on my way into currents I did not understand. And no country would receive me, this ghost come sailing in. And when the night opened up her eyes, more rain, more thunder spilled over me. I saw the errors in my works. I saw the island I could not reach, for all my shame weighed me down, and I nearly died amongst the rocks. Why did we destroy it to return? Adrift, all I did was ask the stars when I'd be lifted from this burning deck. They didn't reply, they didn't bother to shine. This is how I found my soul, warm in the arms of darkness. I was released, I was released. I was caught in the rain today. The skies went black and blue as a baby's bruise. I saw my reflection turn the corner against my will. My heart's terror is the possibility you will find you before me and close the circle of your arms and close the circle of your arms. We should let you play a little more, Mark. I should take my time. Yeah, I'll go walk around the chair a couple times just to let you get it for a minute or two. <laughs> All right, our first micro story. Whoever on the team wrote this micro story, by the way, 10 out of 10 job. Tell us about a time that the world felt like you were an oyster. I danced on the stage at the Raven and earned my first and only dancing table center of attention dollar. It's still in my desk drawer. Aww. Yeah. All right, up next to the mic with a poem. Please put your hands together for Jess. Jess, come on up. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I live up in Stewartsville, New Jersey, so I came down here because I've heard really good things about this open mic. Um, so I'm going to read a poem I wrote a, a little over a year ago because I needed a little self-boost. Um, a year ago, I was writing the first draft of my first novel, which is called The Great Tree of Iris. It's an epic fantasy. It's finally done now. <laughs> Um, I just started submitting it to publishers or agents, and I'm okay with rejection, but they've started coming in, so I'm just trying to keep the hope alive, right? And I'm going to self-publish it if it doesn't get through, but my point being, I just kind of wanted to cheer myself up, so. I wrote this poem a year ago. It's called Two Worlds. Okay. Two Worlds. I live in two worlds. In one, I'm writing a fantasy novel. It's queer AF, and it set my whole life on fire. I'm flying with donut baking dragons and huddling in ice caves with the northern lights cascading in rainbows. I'm rifling through dusty tomes and royal libraries and sailing on the back of a singing phoenix. I'm watching my characters fall in love and all of their gorgeous queerness. It's a place where homo, bi, and transphobia simply don't exist. Elves, half-elves, humans, wizards, and dragons are allowed to find and be themselves and fall in love and save the world. In, a, in the other world, I'm working a full-time job so I can pay the bills and have health insurance and save money. <laughs> Beginning to write at Christmas changed me. Recently, I had dinner with an old friend, and as we dipped steaming garlic knots in vodka sauce, 
We talked about our careers. And I remembered, did I tell you I'm writing a book? My heart raced and a smile curved across my face and I couldn't do anything to stop it. My friend laughed. I can see you're happy about it. Happy is an understatement. When I first set aside the time to write, it was during a mandatory week-long paid time off over the winter holidays, a privilege I know. And I told myself, as I've been saying for years, okay, Jess, you're going to make time and sit down with your fabric-covered notebook and your favorite mug under the Christmas lights, and you're just going to play. You're going to write down everything that you've wanted to see in fantasy novels that you read like it's your second job, and you are gonna dream, and you are going to like it. And I liked it all right. I sat there in my reading nook, no one around, and my mind went blissfully blank, the same way it does when I finally relax at the Jersey Shore, my head lolling as I take in the waves, that deep, salty brine, and feel the breeze on my face. I drew a map never drawn before. I sketched mountains and rivers I soon found out were geographically impossible to make. Uh, city names burst forth from the tip of my ballpoint pen, strange and new and lovely to me. I wrote two scenes that day, and the feeling rose up within me that was something akin to triumph, to graduating from school, to finding something in yourself you didn't know was lost. When I have moments of doubt, when I stare at my draft and think, no one will ever read this, everyone will judge me, it will never be done. People won't read it because it's fantasy queer romance. I can't write romance. I will never get published. How do people kiss anyway? <laughs> How did I miss that plot hole? Does this prophecy make sense? Am I spending literal weeks of my life doing this when I could be applying for jobs, more jobs, or spending more time with my husband or my cat or my friends, or literally any of my other hobbies? And I remember that every single author has had these moments. We all start in the same place, writing names on a page, sketching out a story or a visual map, singing the words of that very first scene, letters into words into sentences, into paragraphs, into chapters. And exactly six months in, I'm brimming with hope every single day because I'm creating a book, and then the first draft is done, and it's actually good. And my notes app is full to bursting every day with ideas and words I pick up around me and reminders of new names and place descriptions. I guess this is what it means to be a writer, to be an author. One day, I grinned wryly at my husband and said, why am I spending so much time on this? He shrugged and smiled and said, I think you have to. Thank you. exceptionally exciting to be witness to. Woo! Yeah. Bring your books, yeah. Bring your books, I love it. 20 bucks, Amazon. Um, all right, tell us about a time that the world felt like your oyster. I was deployed to Charlottesville, Virginia for two years. I had my own apartment, got to rollerbait, blade, and skateboard all the time. I liked all my fellow colleagues and often attended scientific technical, and political briefings. It was heaven. Mm -hmm. The rollerblading really sent me on that one. I was like, that's so freeing. All right, up next, um, I, I had to call this person because I'm just burning to know what this means. Um, in the anything else you'd like us to know about you, um, this artist wrote Italian Renaissance. Please put your hands together for Samir. Samir, come on up. <laughs> So this one is called Italian Renaissance, inspired by the history of Italy, which we visited last week. So that's why it's the Renaissance, right? Ancient cities still standing, separated by narrow bridges, having survived barbaric times and driven to desperate existence on small islands, 
Draconian religious dictates, changes in regimes, changes in emperors. These walls and waters have seen it all. Breathtaking architecture everywhere. Halloween murals and paintings on every doorstep. Maestros weaving glass by fires that burn all day. Widows spinning lace by the window with cells for many a gold coin. It did this all thousands of years before. Seeing is believing. Seeing is imagining. Seeing is replicating. Learning from one renaissance so long ago to having one in the present, one gift of civilization to another, just in a different age at a different time. But there is a difference. What they did and did not steal livelihoods. Our renaissance of technology might come to no good, only time will tell and for another civilization to ponder. Not all is up in the air. We have a safer world, a more regulated world. In spite of ceaseless wars, we are living more serenely than before. Spirituality and religion has evolved. We are more loving as a global people. More open than before, more meaningful. Technology and its reach have made us safer too. And that should not be forgotten as we contemplate the new ills we have begotten. It started as a week on foreign shores, but with exposure to such treasures that mankind bequeaths to its future, one cannot help but think of eternity and be touched in its myriad colors. Thank you. One day, I dream that one of you just hands me like a tiny note when you run up here and you give me a piece of paper that's supposed to have your name on it, like if it's just like a little note that says something. I would not be able to move. I would just be so tickled by that. And every time somebody does it, I'm like, what if it's a tiny note for just me? <laughs> and it never is, but sometimes there are little drawings on them which are very fun, but I just, that, that would, I should just honestly start going to open mics and doing that because I think that that's hilarious. It would just be a bit for myself. Um, all right, our next micro story. Tell us about a time that the world felt like your oyster. Right before I went to the mental hospital. <laughs> All right, up next to the mic for a poem. This next artist wrote in the Anything You'd Like Us to Know About You section. They're a romantic at heart. Please put your hands together for Aisha. Aisha, come on up. <laughs> You guys are 
really following through with these micro stories, and I'm so proud of us because sometimes I get like three of them, and then I get up here and I'm like, what do I say to get everything settled? Um, and we're just, this, whoever wrote this killed it because like, we're getting responses that you wouldn't believe. Um, tell us about a time that the world felt like your oyster. I landed in Berlin at 9 a.m., 2 a.m. my time, and the thrill is one I will never forget. It's like time traveling. Our next performer is going to be performing Poem Times Three, and they shared, Just darn glad to be here. Please put your hands together for Woody Carson Wilson. <laughs> Like so many writers and poets, I have cats. One of them pet has always possessed what we may call resting bitch face. So I took that to its obvious conclusion. I'm reading three poems tonight, and the cat one is first. Bear fight. She was a thick cat built squat like a tank, like a stone gray sphinx. Her gray eyes blank to the misery of normal mortal life. She was enigma. She rose above the strife, solid but sleep body built like a tug. She had a name, but we should have called her thug. Enjoyed hunting mice, rats, crickets, and that. Plus, one time she helped us capture a bat. She'd jump and land with a ponderous oof. She was a badass cat, so damned aloof. So when the day came nigh, as I thought it might, a bear wandered up in the dusk before night, and it looked like our cat wanted a fight. Well, I just had to see that sight. I opened up the door behind which she laid, and thug deployed like an armored brigade, all straight power forward, dual overhead cam with head lowered to the ready like a battering ram. She started off slow, then hit warp speed. Hit that bear in the chest, knocked it up into a tree, didn't drop, didn't stop, just ran right after, and I swear that I heard maniac cat laughter. As she tore up that bear, its fur seemed to melt, and the yard looked like the remnants of a violated pelt. Well, that half-skinned bear finally bolted, ran away. With thug in pursuit, she was gone half a day. She returned with its coat, nothing more to say. As thug tapped the ground with a scepter of bone, it was the bear's own femur. Thug let out a groan. It had been a hard day. She'd sleep like a log, but first she needed a mug full of grog, so she pulled out a head and said, pour it right here, for my enemy's skull is how I drink beer. All that to say, when you visit my house, please do not bring my cat a cheap-ass toy mouse. <laughs> <laughs> You know how last week some of the days were so hot and humid that there was like no discernible difference in feel between body and air and walking was just like swimming minus the fish? Well, I wrote this as a result. So, warm blood. Blood dark the day, blood warm the air, and lifting from my veins, not a solitary care, came long the stream of crimson hue. I saw, then blinked and screamed, hey, you! I need you here in my veins, inside of me, not frolicking where you want to be. I say this with a fearful sigh because I do not wish to die. The carnine mass did pulse and curl and spin itself into a whirl as though it did my words consider it, winced as though those words were bitter. No, seriously, I called. Your ascent is probably steep, but if not in my body, then where will you sleep? And what will you do when the party's done and you coagulate in the sun? It's fine and dandy when it's fun and games, but if I die, it won't be the same, and you will end up a lifeless stain. You're none too smart without my brain. This did seem to give it pause, for I had presented decent cause to reconsider actions ill thought, a reasonable conclusion to what I sought. But the clouds above shifted sweet and spread their cloak across the sky, with many hued wonders vast and replete. I surely thought that I must cry. My blood mist turned a wistful gaze, mournful through the God-bound haze. So beholding those wondrous vistas on high, I finally surrendered with a sigh. Go and take your fill in full. Go and slake your thirst, you bull. Burst from the pen to enter the fray. I guess there is no other way. The last I saw, a crimson veil, as body wilted and skin went pale, er, paler, <laughs> uh, was my blood strength a streak painted across the sky. I wish it well, and now I die. <laughs> that one didn't actually happen. <laughs> so, uh, finally, traditionally, there's been man against the elements, man against the sea, man against himself, and now man against groundhogs. So, trigger alert, I'm dropping a couple F-bombs in this one. 
I was going to say, make sure no kids are in here, but if they're my kids, they've heard them all anyway. So. <laughs> Killing the groundhog. I waited 45 minutes, breath steady, body calm, rifle at the ready, and aimed toward the place where he would stop near his hole. In a moment, he dropped in, the groundhog who made a home by my home. He always returned at this time after he roamed various places like my garden, for surely he raided there daily purely for his sustenance. I assigned no blame, but sad to say, this was the end of his game. He appeared, sat up and scratched his belly. I'd sniffed his den, it was somewhat smelly. He was rather gone to see, like he was right off a bender, long scar down his side, been hit by a fender. And I swear surliness lurked in those eyes, round and brown. He was a groundhog from the wrong side of town. Well, damn, he muttered, it's time to die, but no surprise, I'm not gonna cry, because I made my stake in the human domain, and every one of you assholes is insane. I mean, think of it, every species will kill and kill, none ever gets their fill, a lion will slay till the sun goes down, and you don't see on their faces a frown, no, they do it because it's a pleasure, but not mankind, oh no, take the measure of a man by the excuses he can deploy. I don't kill just because I enjoy the process of dropping some schmuck in the muck. No, I have many reasons, all noble as fuck. Why I take this groundhog, he's so very cute. I interrupted, you're not cute, so the point is moot. <laughs> Screw you, he opined. You pull that trigger and have three good reasons, I figure. Can't have your house foundation undermined. You're not killing an endangered species, so that's fine. Why, there's probably an infestation of groundhogs, though you haven't a clue where they live. Is it bogs? Is it mud? Is it creeks or a townhouse? Anyway, nothing must ex coexist with humans, not a mouse, or anything not properly enslaved like those poor wolf changelings depraved. You mean dogs, I asked, but I have a cat. Oh, and you're the slave, he said. How about that? <laughs> Either way, your species always clears the field. The trees bow down, the bushes yield. As developers swarm to take their plunder, and the bulldozers rip the whole mess asunder. You take a front at our destructive ways, asked I, while calmly meeting his gaze. No, that's all good and well. Look at me. I'm destructive as hell. I burrow a million holes in your yard, leave your expensive <clears throat> landscaping shards, and laugh when your child falls and breaks a leg. It's funny when humans get taken down a peg. Hmm. I, I blinked and considered, shook my head. You're not being smart if you don't want to be dead. He snored and replied, I'm dead, I know it. You can't miss it this range. I doubt you'll blow it. The bullet in the chamber will enter my head. So yeah, asshole human, I know I'm dead. I'd slowed my breath, readjusted my aim. So what's your beef? What's your claim? Just this, he said, all things slay and tear up the planet. It's just the way. Ants swarm far and wide. Their construction depends on point of view because destruction is what they do. And my God, how they fight. Troop colonies in California use all their might in a war of words decades long. When you're dead, it'll still be going strong. There's bears, strip, bears stripping bark from living trees, and deer eating understory, pretty as you please, and ants getting zombie, thus going insane, as the fungus among us eats into their brain. It's kill or be killed, the eternal plan. Everyone accepts it, everyone but man. So you want to know my beef, my main complaint, I get pissed off when humans hem, haw, and faint as their fellows kill seals, coyotes, and moose while flinging out every bullshit excuse. Forget your lying morals and suck it up. Now do the deed already and shut the fuck up. It was a uh, signal to my finger. The bullet flew swift and did not linger. Blood and gristle exploded in a spray. I killed that groundhog. What more to say? I did it because I could, because I had the power, because it felt good, because I owned a gun, because I am human, and often humans kill for no reason other than fun, like so many other animals. I left his carcass for the scavengers of the night. I felt no guilt and no shame because, frankly, he was right. Um, the first thing is that uh, the Animorphs series that we all know and love from the 90s and the early 2000s, people are nodding their heads, it's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a book, style of books that are about children turning into animals and the covers are awful. 
and they look like <laughs> children morphing into, and, like they're just really, like there's always like three animorphs in the middle where you're like, ah, I've never wanted to see that. And one of my questions that I love asking people, uh, and like my, my friends, not just like random people, but like people I know, um, is like, what would your animorph be? Like what would you want your animorph to be? And, um, or like, you know, I think your animorph would be this. And someone, and then an entire group of people once told me that my animorph would be a killer whale. And I really don't know how to feel about that, which is highly related to your last statement of like, well, you know, if other animals want to kill other things for fun, then like they should. And I deeply sat with that statement for quite some time thinking like, mine would be me. Why would I be a killer? Everybody was like, yeah, immediately. Like there was no disagreement. Um, so that was a little tidbit on that. <laughs> so also, now you actually have a new icebreaker. Um, take that, take it home with you, please. Ask your loved ones, what kind of animorph would you be? And I pray that none of you receive killer whale as being your response as what kind of animorph you'd be. <laughs> um, all right, for a poem, please put your hands together. This artist wrote a smiley face next to their name. They have nothing that they'd like us to know. You'll find out. Uh, please put your hands together for Athira. Athira, come on up. Hi, everybody. Huh? Um, you're clearly great all the time, every time. I, I keep thinking. Sure. <laughs> um, so I have a I have three little snippet poems that I've written over the past few years and reading them in my mind at least it reads like a chronology. So I'm just gonna do those. The first one's called Knee Deep in My Garden, Mutilating Living Things. It's strange how we cut away the weaker branches to free the rest so that they may flourish I do the same with things, people, places I love once. Once, fall to the wayside. Detachment may resemble cruelty. I call survival. Um, the second one. Uh, the second one's called Just Science. I'm a black hole where want, need, and love, or lack of them, turned inwards and collapsed on myself. Now an insatiable vacuum that pulls in any dread of love perceived or real. I attach like a leech on you. Please do not let me go. And the third one's called In Your Gravity. The thing with gravity is that we are always falling, the earth catching us each time. Beneath our feet, that's how I imagine being with you tethered in your orbit, falling every second, almost convincing myself that you will come by to catch me, ground me. <clears throat> uh, okay, and the third one, um, so over the past month, you know how they say that life gives you the same lessons till you've learned them? I mean, at this point, I'm just tired of it, like, you know, <laughs> So I wrote this, like, many years back, but it's still valid, which is sad. Um, it's called, I'm the problem, it's me. Uh, some of you might listen to Taylor Swift, you know this. <laughs> but, okay. They say, think of it this way. Would you want to be with someone like him? Would a life even last with someone like him? I think of it that way, and I think I would, because that's who I am. It would, because that's how I am. Like a reverse Dorian Gray, the years from me drain away and flow into the bond every day. It lasts forever while I shrivel and disappear. So yes and yes, but I keep that from my friends. <laughs> For about 20 minutes, exactly between 11 p.m. and 11.20 p.m. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>
performer wanted you to know, he's not a poet or writer, just an observer with a pen. Can be found on Instagram at abenedict16 and on YouTube at, at abenedict. Put your hands together for A. Benedict. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. It's nice to see you all. The third Thursday of the month is my favorite. Oh. And I have a book now that's out. Woo. It's, Woo. It's, called, uh, it's called A Return from Elysium. Oh, it turned off. Oh, it turned off. It turned off. It turned off. Check, check, check. One, two. Did I, I broke it already. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's done. It's everybody. good. <laughs> It's red. good now, I think. It's red. Okay, here we go. Red. Okay. Well, it's, it's red and it's working. <laughs> this is actually my second book. Oh, they're good. Project for now. I'll fix it. <laughs> this is actually my second book. Uh, the first one I wrote about 12 years ago was called Readings from Elysium. Poetry from the streets to the garden. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Elysium. Um, Elysium is basically the mythological place, Roman, Greek place, where heroes and the noble go to die. So uh, that story was basically, that, that book, a collection of poetry, was based on the journey. I thought I went through it all, thought I journeyed it all, and thought I had all the answers. Well, this one's called A Return from Elysium, Racing Sisyphus Up the Mountain. Sisyphus or Vulva, it me. Um, but basically, it, it, it's a continuation. We never really reach that destination, as the old cliche goes. It's true. We continue the journey. So I'm going to read a couple of pieces from the new book and also some newer pieces. First one is called Amethyst. Amethyst. Not that I put an end in there. Amethyst. Two couples sitting in a tea house so welcoming. Dating websites united. But not, 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 not my type of thing. Newly forged couples smiling into each other's eyes brightening. Clouded rusty tea house corners. Glancing my way, pausing from self-righteous and boastful opportunities to impress one another with conversations about Kafka, Kant, and karma. Silence and solitude I'm cherishing, as does the bronze dancing Shiva on the bookshelf shimmering. We wink at one another. My ear artfully again listening, skillfully, to their conversation. My own thoughts vanishing quickly as I hear about her penchant for magic spells, amulets, and the power of amethyst. Acting as if interested, his furrowed eyebrows brandished, wishing for his own magic spell to help him disappear into the night, but not before his eyes cascade from her sparkling eyes to her soft breasts. Excusing himself, at long last, to pee, he shuffles to the bathroom, leaving the girl alone. I smile and say hello, asking about the magic. spinning wheel. Now, some people prescribe to faith. They have faith in things. Some people prescribe to fate. Whatever happens, I'm Morfate. You gotta friggin' deal with it. So, fate's spinning wheel. Fate's wheel is stuck and needs a nudge as it stops between the stimulus and the reaction. Choice is void of self-satisfaction. Pushing and turning, unable to Standing in the pouring rain, watching drips streaming endlessly, collecting into pools ceaselessly, turning emotions of joy into disdain. Fortune and faith are opposite each other, as control of both remain unattainable dreams. Changeable luck left to wonder as faith releases her wheel, spinning fortune to my surprise. Learn to accept faith in the moment and follow it instead of faith if you're wise. Next one's called Irrelevance. <clears throat> Irrelevant lies his moss-covered, overgrown grave, rain streams lightly dropping from his well of eyes, standing upright like an oak, watching, accepting, and brave. Irrelevant 
like a million summer storms before him that melted into inescapable sunsets, wondering about his fall, dropping from lofty heights, speeding toward the bramble-filled forest, vanishing from greatness faster than a March icicle melting. Irrelevant, an end to victorious campaigns, conquered lands and those he vanquished, contemplating ambition and what now remains. Streams of cash and credit once rained down on bejeweled kingdoms of his own making, seeping into the freshly covered dirt, now never ending, sinking into an irrelevant, bottomless pool of tears and regret. Here. And finally tonight, you know, this, this weather that we've had, this hot weather this summer, really has had me reminiscing about youthful days of playing outside and basically staying out, going out after dinner and playing until, you know, I'd hear my mother, Anthony, come in, come in. You know, as all the kids' names get called, because the night's uh, finally here. So this one is actually called, if I can find it here. I'm sorry. Flop sweat. <coughs> so anyway, th this story is basically about those days of, of, of wonder and joy, of playing. Uh, it's called Ghostly Childhood Games. It's not that great. I'm building up this suspense and drum man. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ghostly childhood games played well past summery dusk as a violet sky hung above us, counting down time before evenings closed. Tag, war, ghost in the graveyard were the games of youthful choice. Last minute screams for the ice cream truck and permission for 10 more minutes of pre-bedtime adventure below moonshine. Shooting from thickets of bushes, evening's bats begin to fly. A quick glimpse from the corner of my eye caught the tip of Scorpio's red tail high in the sky. Mm -hmm. A chorus of mothers shouted names all about. Humidity drenched little rock band and cartoon character screen print t-shirts soaked to tiny preteen chests. Moments cherished like nothing since. Honeysuckle battled nighttime jasmine succulents creating an evening backdrop and delicious scent. I scratched my gray beard, wondering where that time went. Reminiscing those childhood games is sometimes so hard as I wander like a ghost in the graveyard. You guys are great. One more quick note. Um, I put in the acknowledgments of this book Thank you to a couple of people. And I say, uh, my, my, especially my poetic community, that's all of you. <laughs> so give a hand for to know about you at Karin dot J E R V E R T. You can find her on Insta. Um, come find me if you'd like to find that written down. I will let you take a picture of this piece of paper. Um, we'll be performing some spoken word, but please put your hands together for Sunday. Sunday, come on up. <laughs> Sunday is, um, I don't know, I think there's something really cool about having a stage name. 
Um, and I've been trying to, I don't know, embody myself differently on stage to remember some things, so someday it is. Um, and I'm gonna stick with it this time. All right, because I did have one other stage name that didn't stick, but. <laughs> All right, so, and also tonight I memorized my poem, and, uh, but man, guys, I don't know what to say about this one. Good luck, um, <laughs> and I love you all, and uh, we'll see, all right? I am not like you. When I die, I rise like chicory. I have never been so light a creature that I could disappear into the sky. I am here. The sun beats down on my body, and in the earth I rot and I stink like all dying things. I am a woman. The rain, like the blood in my veins, washes clean all of my face. I look into creation's eyes, and I do not deny death. I do not deny my body like you do. The earth is my savior, and it is yours too. The tomatoes are still green, we have children to feed, and I am still busy mourning all of the things that you do not teach. I do not covet your magic, the water and the wine of it. It is just theater to me. The soul is not whole without the body, and we do not eat without the rain. Yet you still strive to disappear from the flesh, while you claim its confusion with spirit is the biggest sin there is. While well, milk for your glory comes from my breasts. A mother is no singular miracle. But what do you teach of me? Tending your flower season after season for its medicine. That infinite patience, is it more powerful than multiplying bread and fish at your one divine dinner table? You raise one man up from the dead, and I lay 3,000 down more with love. I sit at the bedside of a sick man, and I smile and I pray for him. So my love, I call the rain. Even if I know your laws, even if I know that you don't want me to, I call the rain, even if for centuries you have asked me to abstain, I call the rain. I am a woman. I call the rain. The tomatoes are still green, and I die with every wilting flower and every child. But I will rise again like chicory. Does it just now become like my emotional support microphone? <laughs> I don't want to put it down because it might fall or it'll clank or so. I'm going to keep holding on. It make me feel safe. Um, because everyone knows this room is like really unsafe feeling. <laughs> uh, all these poets everywhere. 
All right, tell us about a time that the world felt like your oyster. When I was in the high, when I was in the school play my senior year of high school. Mm. Yeah. Positive mu musical theater memories. Um, all right, our next performer has written many things on this piece of paper, of which I will read to you, because it made me smile. They circled poem and then put a question mark next to spoken word and said, oh, well, maybe. Um, <laughs> and then next to, is there anything else you'd like us to know about you? They said, I got you in five minutes, fam. Please put your hands together for Michael DeMann. <laughs> Princeton, can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah. yeah. One more? Hell yeah. yeah. All right, all right, let's keep this going. My name is Michael DeMann. I'm going to give you the whole thing later after this first piece. But I have two new pieces I'm going to read first, and then I have one that I read last time, all right? This first one is called Trying to Be Someone Else's Metal Isn't Metal. I check the obituaries every day to make sure you are still with us. I fly through Google like a frivolous fighter jet, unfortunately finding out I cannot control you, your decisions, who you choose to love, the places you spend your time, or the travels you experience, the times you don't miss us. So the times I spent searching are worth every single second. But I hated always being your second or third or fourth, a bronze medal, knowing I always treated you like gold, knowing I always treated you the way I wanted to be treated. Knowing I don't ever, ever have to be like you. Knowing now you taught me an invaluable life lesson of self-care, Princeton. Knowing I can one day love myself the same way. Thank you. Yeah. Like I said before, my name is Michael DeMann. I'm a poet and prose writer from Jersey City, New Jersey. On August 1st, say that with me one more time, August 1st. August 1st. On August 1st, I'm gonna be on PBS as a feature artist. And thank you, thank you. So if, if anybody here believes in themselves as much as you believe in your art, come to the Jersey Shore Art Center. The Jersey Shore Arts Center on August 1st. And the show starts at seven o'clock, there's gonna be an open mic. But anyway, I don't wanna to take too much time away from you guys, I have two more pieces. This next one is also new. It's about the guy who got me here. It's about my father, Michael DeMann Sr. Woo. The heights still own my soul. Your car sits fenced in. Rusting at the dump by the waterfront after mahogany paid for as gold was buried deeper than our own very souls. The yardsticks we whittled away at never knew what they were carved for until they measured every single inch, six feet. I'll always keep a parking spot for you at the end of the block where we can laugh and smoke cigarettes until the sun comes up and we can bask over the night until the dawn spreads our legs and sends us back to work. I'll never forget the times on Hancock Avenue. I'll never forget the times on Austin Avenue. I'll never forget the times I said I love you 
on the avenue. I still look for you on Witherspoon Street. I still look for you. Thank you. <laughs> One more piece. One more piece. Thank you, Brush Rabbit. Thank you, Billy Joel. I love you. <laughs> <Billy Joel. laughs> This, this place has always been a really big home for me. There's a lot of very, very, very talented people in the audience, and I can't tell you how much I feel blessed by being here, doing such amazing things. I read this poem last time. It's called Roof Shingles Were Crafted <clears throat> for Squats. They say the party doesn't end until the morning. But I've seen ripped open cigarillo wrappers at 4 a.m. that beg to differ. May the whispers in the woods never catch us smoking in the winds. The willow trees, they lower their branches for us. So we don't have to branch off into the things that get us planted. The soil, they wouldn't want our ashy veins anyway. Our Marlboro butts collecting the gutters off of the roofs that we squat on. The no soliciting signs say they'll arrest us, but we, Princeton, we only attest to time. Though the clock points in the wrong direction, that might be the wrong direction. <laughs> Our souls always know to follow. And though we may not remember the night, we all still stumble awake, crumbs in our pockets, hand in hand, story to story. We rip through situations as writers in this revelation. I loaded revolvers ready. We used to cook in the line. But lines are the only things I cook now. And Princeton Arts Council, let me tell you, I am a motherfucking chef. Thank you. <laughs> Reading Don Quixote by candlelight during a blizzard. Oh. <laughs> All right, please put your hands together for a poem by Lillian. Lillian, come on up. First of all, I haven't spoken in public in 19 years. 
So this is really a traumatic event for me tonight. And yeah, oh, that will help an awful lot. <laughs> I am shaking. I'm really, really shaking. That's how we all start. Pretend we're all naked. <laughs> <laughs> please, please. Okay. It's okay. All right. I, I was hoping, I said, if there's a podium, at least I can hide somewhat behind something. And then I would feel a little bit better. So, okay. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Story first, and then my poem. When I was in ninth grade, my English teacher, Ms. Cromberg, came in one day and said, we're gonna start a new unit. So I was expecting her to say to take out our anthologies. You remember the big, thick books with poetry and stories and everything in them, but she didn't. She went over to the closet and she got out paperback books. Now, the year was 1960, I was in ninth grade. They didn't use paperback books then, if any of you are old enough to remember that. Everything was hardcover. So this was going to be something exciting. So she came over and handed out these books, and I looked at it, and it was Edith Hamilton's Mythology. Well, let me tell you, that unit and going through mythology just blew my mind. I fell in love with the gods and goddesses. I fell in love with the myths. But most importantly, I fell in love with Pegasus. You know, the winged horse, that steed, the one that would bring Zeus his thunderbolts and lightning, and the one that is the seeds of creativity. So, my new friends, I offer you tonight a poem for all of you, if you've ever felt the way I did, but I also devote this to Pegasus. The title of my poem is Within the Sacred Space. As silence stalks the shades of night, an ebony-shrouded pilgrim treads upon Medusa's broken tears to paths below Diana's reach, while he unwebs the dusty way past relics of the ancient dirge. The memory of tomorrow waits to relume orgasmic flames. The skeleton of habit leads through catacombs of empty air. Alone within this sacred space, the pilgrim strains to glimpse the steed. But mist grows thick, his vision poor, and once again he cannot see. He turns, for now, to pray and moans. You are my curse, my ecstasy.
Given recent events, I thought that I should revisit a few poems. One a shooting, the other a suicide. This one in regards to the shooting. <coughs> Clergymen and physicians, there is a need of healing. The world is hurting. Industrialists, environmentalists, scientists, cultivators take heed of the land, the air, and the water. The world is collapsing. Homeless people, parents with wayward children, those living in war-torn countries, the world is crying. Politicians, legislators, leaders, law enforcement, be mindful of the laws of society, morale, and ethics. The world is watching. Those with potential, capabilities, and talents, the world is waiting. Poets, musicians, authors, teachers, protesters, or anyone with a message, the world is listening. Those who believe that there is a bright side when surrounded by darkness, the world is hoping. Be aware of the time you have left. The world is turning. suicide. This one is called While You Breathe You Have Options. Not by hypodermic needle, not by the jumping off of the bridge, not by way of razor blade to the wrists and throat, nor by noose around the neck, not a gun to the head. While you breathe you have options. Each day is your day to shine. Each day is a day of discoveries. Each day is a day of wonder. It's not about age and others' view of experience. Every day is an experience. You have eyes to see, you have ears to hear, you have hands to work, you have legs to walk or run, and a mouth to speak. And the loss of one or more does not diminish the others that remain. Those that can do, so do. The path is before you, so travel. While you breathe, you have options. Things are not at an end because of gray hairs, skin not defying gravity, steps taken that are slower, changing of tastes, or false wisdom that says that you're spent and have nowhere to go. Everyone has opinions, but opinions are not facts. Past afflictions may be present, but they do not have to be the future. It is one thing to hear voices inside your head, but it is another thing whether or not to listen. Life doesn't belong to just the young. It belongs to those who are here and who are now. There are audiences to hear and witness. There are lives to touch. There are messages to tell, joy to spread, love to give, friends to make, places to go, and things to see and things to learn if you want to. Suicide may be considered an option, but it is one that shuts the door to other options. While you breathe, you have options. Thank you. Um, I'm going to depart from my prepared remarks. I'm just going to tell a really quick story and I'll be done. So, a big part of my life is that my brother has autism. You know, it's a big part of 
just growing up. He's three years older than me and that kind of thing. And a big part of autism, the condition he's in, is that he's in routines, you know, like, you know, it's based a lot around what we eat, you know. So, you know, Monday is salad night, you know, the salad, Tuesday's pizza night. And on lunch, you know, lunch during the day, we would go out, you know, he would get like fast food from a lot of places, you know, reserve your judgment. For a while, he would go to McDonald's every day, and that's where we went. And one time, it was coming up to Christmas, and, you know, he still had his pattern. You know, he celebrates the holidays, not an apostate, but at the same time, uh, it was important to, like, kind of keep his routine going. So something my dad did to deal with that was the night before, he goes to McDonald's and gets the same lunch that he would have gotten the next day. So Christmas morning, he's got the lunch prepared in the uh, passenger seat of the car, and, uh, you know, he drives up into a closed McDonald's and just hands my brother the lunch from the front seat, and it's fine. As he's pulling out, there's a guy coming into the McDonald's, and he does like a thumbs up, they're open. <laughs> my dad reaches to the back of the car and pulls out the bag and says, yeah, and drives off. What happened to that guy and how he found out? He'll never know, but the explanation is impossible. Thank you very much. Many of you might understand this. One time I took a math test that I was so stressed out about. Like, my eyes were twitching without my control. Um, and I walked out of that class, and I was like the third person in there. It was like the last people struggling. You could have hit me with a car, and I would have been like, I love it. It's great. I was, I don't think I've ever been that happy just because it was over and it was the most stressful thing that I've ever done. And it was like, I didn't care if I failed. I didn't care what happened. I didn't care if I fell a hole and I never got out. I, it was over, it, I did it, you know? All right, so. What was the grade? <laughs> Do you know what? It's well, so messed watch. up, I don't even know. Because it was a <laughs> final. And some professors are just like, I don't care about you. This is your ending grade. You don't get to know how you did, which I too, that makes me, um, that makes me want to write a Google review. <laughs> yeah, right. I just think, yeah, but I don't do that. Like, you know, I have a hard job. So, all right. Up next to the mic, um, please put your hands together for a poetess, Linda Lanza. Linda. Come on up. It's called sagebrush parole. You find your own way to do it, and you do it that way. Yesterday we laid in 12 miles of barbed wire fence, walking the load out, coaxing it back by walking, rolling, walking, careful to fit your hands to the vicious twisted pattern unraveling slotting it into the desert like a puzzle. You find your own way to do it, and you do it that way. Slash and burn work in Humboldt Forest near Cave Lake. Cut and stack cords of firewood in a burgeoning spiral. Walking the load out, coaxing it back by rocking, rolling, walking like my dreams on clear nights when Cassiopeia lights the peaks of Quinn Canyon Range to the west, Mount Moriah to the east. 
you find your own way to do it and you do it that way. An arrowhead shard, my starship through a chambered nautilus. Each new stack moving me one step closer to release. Walking the load out, coaxing it back by walking, rolling, walking. I'll teach you how to play cribbage when I get out. And if I don't, you can always remember that I wanted to. You find your own way to do it, and you do it that way, walking the load out, coaxing it back by walking, rolling, walking. a little. I saw a sofa walking. Mine Street is on, uh, near the uh, New Brunswick campus of Rutgers. <laughs> I saw a sofa walking. A sofa was walking down Mine Street upside down, wearing jeans and Adidas sneakers. A cushion hung down its front, held by what could only be called a hand. Earlier, I had seen it leaning against a utility pole at the curb, recycling day for garbage collection. No jeans, no sneakers, no hands, from what I could see with a perfunctory glance. By chance, a car was coming. I couldn't tell if the sofa had eyes, ears, but I yelled, watch it! The sofa stopped. The cushion dropped in the street. I held up a hand to the oncoming car. It swerved with a honk and drove on. You all right? I called out. If you could just hand me that cushion, I'll be fine, said the sofa. I picked it up. The hand, like appendage, regained its hold. A voice inside the upholstery said, thanks. I answered, my pleasure. The sofa and a woman who talks to furniture walked on. <laughs> this is a, a longer poem, an ekphrastic poem. It was uh, inspired by a painting or a serigraph I saw called Paris Match. And the title is called Paris Titavillus. Titavillus is the calligrapher's demon. Uh, spilled ink, misspelled words. Paris Titavillus. Titavillus scribes demon would have her think Paris is a state of mind. Paradise if it had more letters. That marks and arches flooding roses Paris match are enough to still the sirens. Brush marks blur and blink like Matisse, paper cuts on speed in 3D mimicking Montmartre, the eighth arrondissement, the Champs Elysees. Black swaths flow sane like in two places, masking and arcing over dotted lovers listing near sidewalk cafes. Pain au chocolat, café au lait. Black and red and white scribal tradition, the alchemist's palette, form a terra firma crucible for the golden elliptic pas de dieu, zooming closer to the white span across the nighttime river, a red squaring of a circle like blood, like the heat of Leslie Caron and Gene Kelly jungle dancing on the cobbled urban bridge. Breathless live legs and musculature touching and melding, touching, emitting sparks, tearing away, turning face to face, looking away, walking away, turning. Here, Phobos Mona Lisa magnetizes millions, cryptic in her mystery still, and in spite of Pei's pyramid pointing heavenward, vainly, ever ready to transmit and receive. She smiles privately. Is that a hand? 
that mark, an upturned palm juggling three balls. C'est très folie. C'est très folie. She smiles eternally knowing the show veils most of what's behind, beneath, before, below, conceals what cannot be known but only surmised, guessed at through a fogged and muddied lens depending. <clears throat> She would disregard the inhospitable repute to squint at boxy window shapes and listen. Dexter's reedy tenor inveigles the timorous visitor to divest her citizenship for a midnight cab ride through rainy streets to a blue-noted alley, a shaded lamp in a wooded foyer, a third-floor walk-up where flame shadows shoot to a 12-foot ceiling from a mantled fireplace. Marked and arched, the trompe l'oeil tricks her heart into feeling up. Does that say up? Or is she reading too much into it? She finds the leather, the, the leather bound, she finds the leather bound and gilt edge primer for a language she cannot speak but dreamed before she was born and dreams it still when she and Mars are in retrograde. Yeah. One more, this is called Footnote. It used to be a kinetic poem. I would do this yoga kind of thing, but I'm just too old for that now and the joints just don't work, so I'll just read it to you. Footnote, in her hand is a handmade book, handmade paper taken down by hand, folios manually folded, signatures handily stitched, handwriting illuminated between hand tooled covers, hand bound, and signed in the hand of the writer, writing of ancestors who by will and tradition, handed down, had their feet bound. So to grow fully grown, they could not walk. Footnote, she knows those who cannot walk sometimes fly. <laughs> apparitions, but sometimes I can hear, not directly, but as an echo, my past calling me back to a place that's been forgotten. And for an inst moment, I'm in between, not quite here, not, I'm in between, not quite here, not quite there, grasping at the fringes of something I can't quite remember, then losing it all together and finding myself standing in the kitchen with a spoon in my hand. And sometimes, on rainy afternoons, I can smell the, go the smoke of long extinguished fires rising from a cold heart, filling this house with the phantom of warmth. And sometimes, I can taste you on my lips, even though we haven't kissed since we were kids. And sometimes, a flashback strikes like lightning, cracks like thunder, sometimes I wonder, if these are ghosts, but then I remember, ghosts aren't real, and my past is gone. And these feelings stirring inside of me are like dead leaves in the fall rustling down the street, soon to be soil for new trees to grow. Thank you. All right, and I did this one last time. 
time, so if you heard it already, I'm sorry. And if it doesn't come out right, I'm also sorry. <laughs> Moments are minutes that I can't confine. Sometimes I forget and think that they're mine. In pictures and stories that fade over time, I can't get them back, but still I'm trying to return to those places for some peace of mind, to get back to the faces that I left behind. Like a shell on the shore washed up with the tide, I can talk of the ocean, but I'm empty inside. A whisper of sound that barely survived, a memory of home remains in my mind. Thank you. They wanted us to know, I sleep on my porch under the firefly lights. Please put your hands together for Suits. Hello, um, I'm Suze, and I'm going to tell a story. So all good stories start with once upon a time. So once upon a time, I was married. And then a time or two after that, I wasn't anymore. And uh, my dad used to say to me, um, you're not as dumb as you look, you couldn't be. And uh, <laughs> it's charming. And um, so I think my husband had, must have heard that from me a couple times because he pulled up a big old fast one on me, my ex-husband. Um, so he said he paid for a trip for me to go to a dance yoga uh, certification in Costa Rica, first and only time I've ever been out of the country. And I was so excited to go. And about three minutes after I got everything arranged and paid for with his money, I got the certified letter saying we were getting divorced while I was out of the country. Oh, so I wasn't going to my own divorce. Yeah, I know. I know. Shock silence. So, bastard. Um, anyway, so I paid for an extra, and I am cheap as they come, but I paid for an extra suitcase to bring my wedding dress with me. And um, I walked down to the beach um, in Hako, and I went right into the ocean in my wedding dress on my divorce day, um, much to the applause and laughter and photographs of all the people on the beach. That's not even the story. Okay. <laughs> That's just the story. That's just the story. Part two. Um, so I got my revenge by again renting a little house in Lambertville which is where I want to live someday, if anybody cares to live there with me and help me get more dogs. Anyway, um, so I rented this little place and the place took my two dogs and my cat, my little, my little ensemble. And um, it was day one and I moved into this little place and then my house, I was in the kitchen and my house was surrounded with the boxes and you know, cause I'm a weirdo, so I wasn't putting away like actual furniture, I was putting away like my fiesta wear and my favorite <laughs> collection, you know? And, um, and, you know, back in the olden days, a dude used to come and like put the internet in and put your cable in and, you know, interweb and like do the whatever, the home phone. They used to have those. Anybody young in here, they used to have a phone at your house. It's called a landline. So a dude was coming and I knew he was going to be there all day. And um, he showed up, doorbell rang, and a guy as big as the house is there. And um, he looked like LT or Refrigerator Perry for any old Giants fans in the audience. Um, and super nice guy, his name was George, came in and he starts puttering around and I'm puttering in the kitchen. And um, he's, I have my, so I believe I, I have my console record player going. You guys might call it a turntable, but I'm cooler than you, so it's called a record player. <laughs> and it was on and I had my radio on. It's not a tuner, it's a radio. Anyway, um, again, I'm old. So I had that on, we were listening to some old R&B. You know, some Anita Baker, you know I love her, I want to marry her. Um, some Marvin Gaye, some Shirelles, all that stuff, some old jazz. And then, take the needle off the record because the song comes on and it's Ribbon in the Sky from Stevie Wonder. I don't know if anybody knows that song. Sure. 
Okay. So I knew that song from when I was a teenager because at the time also there used to be videos and I used to watch BET, which was black entertainment television, and they had a video for Rainbow in the Sky, Ribbons in the Sky, excuse me, that had literally a ballet dancer gorgeous and she was dancing in the sky with ribbons. It was very literal, but I watched it for hours, just this ballerina twisting around with these ribbons and imagined I was her on occasion, you know. So I go over and I turn it off. And George says to me, what's going on? You know, because we had been kind of kibitzing a little bit. And, um, and I said, oh, I can't listen to that song. I just got divorced, I'm really raw. That was my wedding song. Um, and there was a silence and then he says, well, do you want to make a new memory? And I was like, mm, what are you talking about? Because <laughs> I've watched porn. And, um, <laughs> what the hell and I reached out and I took his hand and then he flipped whatever back on and here comes the damn song again and uh, we start I dance all the time I'm a really good dancer but that whole like slow dance with another human not so much so it was like that big guy and he's holding me and I'm doing that whole like <laughs> you know that prom dancing that you do is so awkward I'm doing that it's a long song. It's like seven <laughs> minutes long. <laughs> but we danced the whole thing around that kitchen. And um, then the song stopped and he said, all right, you good? And I said, yeah, I'm good now. And I can listen to that song again. And I just wanted to say, I always cry at the end of my stories. I will always cry at the end of my stories. So that was the day I took my song back, thanks to a little kitchen in Lambertville and a cable guy named George. <laughs> <laughs> something and I guess that's an option. <laughs> Dance in the kitchen. All right, up next to the mic for a poem, I will read what this person would like us to know about them. I can make quiche. Lorraine and I have seen the B-52s in concert more than five times. Please put your hands together for William Beck. <laughs> Um, uh, please um, let's thank uh, Mark and Brass Rabbit once again putting together the yeah. event. I'm William Beck. Um, so this is lovingly dedicated. It's probably closer to being like a, a short, short story or flash fiction. Um, this is lovingly dedicated to anyone, anyone who's ever had to deal with that mean girl or that bullying asshole or, you know, in my case, it was like eight of them when I was coming up. Yeah. And um, this is loving, lovingly dedicated to all of you. And this is called, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I humbly present the Battle of Bell Park. It was July 1984. We were in Bell Park in the middle of Ocean Grove. You could smell the honeysuckle. The yellow jackets seemed suspended in the air. And it had been going on for years. Hey, you, you fucking wussy! And there he was in the middle of Bell Park, Guy Alfaro. Biggest badass in town. And he'd been beating my ass for years. I mean, it was nothing new. And I knew exactly what was going to happen. I knew he was going to tear me apart. So I figured mouthing off to him didn't really matter. There's a certain amount of fatalism involved here. I figured I'd give him as much shit as I could before the lights went out. And there was his little bitch, 
Jimmy Richter. As much as I hated Guy, I hated this little shit more. At least Guy was out front, ready to take a hit. But his little bitch Jimmy always hid behind him. It was Bell Park, Ocean Grove. The air was warm. It was a pleasant night. As good a night as any to get your ass kicked, I guess. Hey, God, what's the difference between you and a steaming piece of shit? And Einstein asks, what? Absolutely nothing, God. Absolutely fucking nothing. And he hit me in the head. Wham! And there were these silent fireworks, displays in my head, blue, white, purple, beautiful, really. And I hit him twice, once in the mouth, once more the second time drawing blood. Son of a bitch, you fucking pussy! And every time he hit me, I hit him back. And it's logged on, punch for punch, insult for insult, all those years of being tormented by this asshole, pouring out like the blood gushing out of guy's nose. Every punch he landed, I landed two more. All of those years of abuse hardened into bleeding fists. And I permanently wiped that shit-eating grin off of Guy's face with a blow that sent blood, spit, and his pride flying. <laughs> he never harmed a hair on my head after that day, and neither did anybody else. Years later, his sidekick Jimmy, now my friend, told me, you know, Bill, he'd never admit it. But after that day, he respected you. Yeah, but what a way to earn it. Thank you. How are we doing on time, Brass? Do we have time for one more? Okay. So, I've had many friends in my life, and not all of them have walked on two legs. And this, is dedicated to a friend who's no longer with us, um, my cat, Morris. And this is written about him. Uh, I think it's a great poem. It's a stupid title, but it's a great poem. This is called, And the Stars Shall Be My Chew Toys. My cat climbs into the night and wraps himself up in the darkness like a warm blanket. He plucks the stars from the sky, like captured robins, and hides them for me to find around the house. Here's a blue giant under the sofa. On my doorstep, a red dwarf. And I breathe on each one, and with a word of encouragement, send them back into the ether. I'd love to hide the universe under the furniture, but the stars are for everyone to share. And someday, someday my cat will learn that. But until then, I'll keep patiently unearthing Zeta, Zeta Reticuli from my seat cushions and coaxing it back to heaven before nightfall over and over and over again. Thank you and have a good night. It's all Thank you. just friends. I walked away with painful clarity, walked out to a rainbow in the sky, and an old man who says to me, they say there's a pot of gold at the other end of every rainbow. True story. All right, up next to the mic.
mic, please put your hands together for some spoken word by Matawasa. Matawasa, come on up. Hi everyone, my name is Madalasa, and this is my first time here, so welcome. I just before I begin, I wanted to say that my mom always tells me that it's not the happy people who are thankful, but the thankful people who are happy. And I'm so thankful for sharing and like hearing you all speak. So thank you so much. This one's called The Craft of Pain. I bleed in lilac, the first color that dripped from the tip of your brush when you whispered, I want you as my art. My cheeks flushed lavender, the scent of your fickle fingers when you traced my jaw and stenciled the canvas. Our hands met, but our eyes touched, and the hopeless in my romantic put all her hope in you. I once read that hope is a fragile thing, but my darkening, desperate daydreams crave your colorful canvases. Search strength in every shade, hunt hope in every hypnotic hue, and accept your abstract, artistic apology. But you paint my seas in charcoal desolation and stain me in scarlet anguish. Your pencil shades my body over my sharp lines and under my exposed tones. My periwinkle painted nails drain all traces of color, and you clasp them with your pretty pink lies, and I see your faded fingers, transforming into colorless claws of a monster I no longer recognize. So I bleed in lilac, the first color your canvas felt when you whispered, I want you as my art. I bleed in lilac. The first blurry vision I saw when you breathed it was one mistake, and I bleed in lilac. The first color that disappeared when I whispered, your touch strangles my light. And now you paint me. You paint me paying your sins, and you stain me staying alive. Thank you. <laughs> poetry and they would all like us to know I do climate change theater. Please put your hands together for Steve. Steve, come on up. <laughs> takes care of Heron Town Woods. Anyone heard of Woo! Yeah. Our garden. You have a community here, <laughs> and we have a community out there, a couple miles, outskirts of Princeton. Um, Sunday mornings we get together to pull weeds and cut invasive species. I've been doing habitat restoration in town for about 20 years, and uh, about 10 years ago, I started realizing that climate change was this giant dark cloud hanging over that could wipe out everything I do in terms of its power. And so uh, these theatrical scenes started coming to me and uh, I started writing climate change theater, so, which I haven't performed since COVID, so I'm a little jittery. Uh, but in this one, I have a science background, but theater has really helped me to understand things that are scientific, interestingly enough. So I'm going to be a carbon dioxide molecule. My body is carbon, kind of black. And then each hand is an oxygen. So CO2, two oxygens, a carbon. And uh, it's a miraculous, wonderful molecule and we just have too much of it now. Too much of a good thing. 
We're an it, not a he, not a she. LGBT has nothing on us three because we're CO2, you see? Just a little bit of matter that never used to matter. Oh, you thought you knew us. We were harmless, we were good, we always did what we should. We fed the plants. We kept the planet nice and warm in a cold, cold universe. Never did nobody no harm. We're just an eensy weensy bit of nothing you can see, nothing you can smell, nothing you can feel. Hard to think we're really real, but we could steal. It's just not fair what they say about us. We're a real do-gooder. We carry carbon from the dead back to your garden bed on the wings of oxygen. The plants, they eat us to make life anew. It's true, we're a miracle forever in the making. Okay, it's also true, a long time ago, there were too many of us doing too much good. The planet was way too hot, so nature buried a whole lot of carbon underground. The earth was cooler, and life was good, till all that carbon underground was found. Uh-oh. Coal, oil, natural gas, enough down under to last and last. They dug me up and burned me up and up and up. I went uh, on the wings of oxygen, doing good, so much good, too much good. The seasons, uh, let's see, the, earth, uh, the seasons, they grew hotter. What once was lots was now a whole lot louder. The oceans looked so placid, but we were turning them to acid. Tiny seashells turning flaccid. Look it up, look it up, look it up. The less carbon stored, the more in store to shake civilization to the core. We could say more, but we're CO2 and we can't talk. You didn't hear what we just said. You can't see us, but we're here. And bit by bit, we're building up to steal those seasons you hold so dear. Some people still think we're nothing, and so they do nothing, while something is doing a whole lot of something. It's changed the world forever. Some people go to movies about big, mean monsters that want to destroy the world and almost do it, but are stopped just at the last moment by outside all eensy-weensy, teeny-weeny little old weeds that no one can feel or smell or see with no ill intent, no sickness or disease. Turn the skies and seas into eternal enemies. Don't make us do this. Don't burn me up. Let oxygen be oxygen to nourish life and not machines. Find energy above the ground and leave the carbon underground so that all the seasons can stick around and all the people yet to come will think you clever. Look at us. We work together. So can you, to save the weather. I know you guys are all like, wow, I can't wait for that sound to happen again. That like. <laughs> Average height, I don't know. I don't know what the average height is. <laughs> All right. Five foot two for a woman. I know five nine is, is the average height for a woman. All right. Up next to the mic, we have a note to be informed of. I just want to be a light in the dark. Please put your hands together for Bree. Bree, come on up. How's everyone doing? Good, good. A lot of talent here tonight. I'm happy to be here. I just got out of the hospital, so I'm like, this is the first thing I've done outside of my treatment, so. <laughs> All right, I wrote this yesterday. <laughs> this is called Fictional Faces, Real Reflections. In kindergarten, I watched as Violet Baudelaire in Lemony Snicket's series of unfortunate events put her hair up in a ponytail every time she was about to be innovative. I yearned to be like Violet. There's always something 
Violet's words echo in my head to this day. There is always something. In the second grade, I watched the little boy in James and the Giant Peach hungrily lick the crumbs from a bag of chips because he was starving. Then, at school, I ripped open my bag of Lay's and licked the salt off the sides. A boy named Isaiah pointed at and ridiculed me for doing so. I cried and ran to tell the lunch aide, and we both ended up in the principal's office. Isaiah was reduced to tears as he was lectured. I guess you could say I got the last laugh in that debacle. In middle school, I was obsessed with Gurr from Invader Zim. I dressed up as him for my last year of trick-or-treating. I got a pillowcase full of candy. Just as I was about to dig into my loot, I received a call from my father. And right as I was about to tell him how many Reese's peanut butter cups I scored for him, he dropped a bomb on me by saying he was moving to Illinois. I ran upstairs and sobbed for hours. The irony was not missed on me, how I was dressed up as the happiest character in all of children's media whilst crying my eyes out. I could have used some of Gurr's incessant positivity right about then. In high school, I got heavily involved as a flat out weeaboo, which if you don't know, is like the anime equivalent of thinking you're a wizard after reading Harry Potter. <laughs> I cosplayed dozens of characters, ingested all the anime I could stomach, and read and wrote fan fictions like there was no tomorrow. But one character that stands out to me even today is none other than Sans from Undertale. I don't want to spoil the plot of the game for anyone who feels so inclined to download it due to this performance, but please play the game, it's amazing. And so, without giving too much away, I will simply state that Sans, a skeleton monster living in the underground, carries a weight on his shoulders that no one else in the game seems to even be aware of. And yet, despite everything he has been through and continues to go through, he still smiles, like, literally all of the time, cracks jokes, and plays harmless pranks on people. I want to be like that. I want to smile despite being in great, deep, emotional pain. But I can't do that. I can't smile and pretend everything is fine when it's not. And at the end of the day, despite how much I project onto them, I'll never be Violet Baudelaire, or James Trotter, or Gurr, or Sands, or any other fictional character. I'm me. I'm a human being with my own thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. I love chocolate-covered pretzels and the beach. I hate paper cuts and hot weather. I want to be a mom someday. I'm afraid of the dark and insects. I have so much to offer and so little to hide, but I'm scared. I'm terrified to be myself because what if myself isn't good enough? What if my sins outweigh my goodwill? What if it's too late to fix the world more than I help to damage it? No. That can't be true. No more what ifs, no more excuses. I'm going to leave this place better than I found it. Even if it feels like nothing can illuminate the darkness around me, even if it feels like nothing is working because at the end of the day, there's always something. Thank you. I want you to get out your phones, I want you to get out your tablets, your stones, whatever you do. August 15th, our theme's going to be whoops. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> September 19th, so I ask myself, why not? Oh, October 17th, and I realized what was really going on. <laughs> November 21st, 
open the scene. Thank you guys so much for coming out.